Hey everyone, this lesson is on Unit 1, Standard 5, or Chapter 55 in your book, and it's about ecosystems. So if you remember, as we were going through the book, or going through the chapters, we're going from small to big. So we started with organisms and animal behavior, then we went to populations, which is a whole bunch of the same organism, then the last one was communities, which is a whole bunch of populations, and now ecosystems is generally a whole bunch of communities. So the, the real definition of an ecosystem is the sum of all organisms living within its boundaries, a biotic community, plus abiotic factors in which to interact. And if you remember, abiotic means non-living and biotic means living. So um, a combination of the community of living things plus non-living things. There are two unique processes you need to know and they're very different in terms of how they interact with an environment. One is called energy flow and the other one is called chemical cycling. So I have this diagram here, and um, first of all, let's follow like these blue lines, chemical cycling. So chemicals usually start with the primary producers, which are then eaten by primary consumers, which are then eaten by secondary consumers or third, uh, tertiary consumers or third consumers. Um, eventually, like us, like humans, they eventually die, become the soil, and it starts this chemical process all over again. Um, they're usually eaten by microorganisms or detritus, and go back into the soil and become primary producers. Sometimes they could skip steps, so like from primary producers they can go straight into bacteria or detritus or detritivores and start that process all, all over. But you should know that chemicals and, and ecosystems, they cycle. It goes, um, it goes around and around and around. That is different from the orange arrow, which is energy flow. Energy flows one way and doesn't cycle at all. So the energy from the earth all comes from the sun, which goes into primary producers like plants and plankton which that, that energy then goes to primary consumers, secondary consumers, but it doesn't cycle back. You may notice that in each box there's this little squiggly arrow, and what that means is that it's lost by heat or the energy is used, and then it dies and there is used again. So energy, these orange arrows, they die, whereas the blue, um, representing chemicals, they cycle. So that's a review about energy flow. Energy cannot be recycled, okay? It has to be constantly supplied by the sun, okay? These, are, uh, these energy sources um, have their own names. The one that is the self-feeders, they're called autotrophs. Auto meaning, you know, like automobile, like it automatically happens. Troph meaning energy. So they automatically make their own energy. They're called primary producers and they're usually photosynthetic, meaning plants or algae. They use light energy to make sugars and, and feed themselves, essentially. If they can't feed themselves, they're not called autotrophs, they're called heterotrophs, meaning other feeders they can't make their own food and they usually eat other heterotrophs or they eat autotrophs. So here's, um, here's an example of heterotrophs. Um, we have carnivores and herbivores. Um, this is the exact same diagram that I showed you earlier but it's kind of like reversed. Heterotrophs are at trophic levels above the primary producers and depend on their photosynthetic output. So again, these are all names and stuff that you should be familiar with and if you're not, I think you all can understand it just by mentioning it. Herbivores that eat primary producers are called primary consumers. Carnivores that eat the herbivores are called secondary consumers. And carnivores that eat other carnivores are called tertiary consumers, are called third consumers. The ones that most people um, forget are detritivores and decomposers. They get energy from detritus. Detritus is non-living organic material. And they play a very important role in terms of chemicals and materials cycling throughout an ecosystem. So here's some decomposers that you should know of, fungi, and uh, prokaryotes, which are single-celled organisms um, that don't have a nucleus. Those are the ones that cycle, th those are the ones that cycle chemicals throughout an ecosystem. So speaking of primary production, so we're talking about plants again, primary production has its own unit and value. Primary production is the amount of light energy that is converted into chemical energy. So if I, if I compare different ecosystems, if I say what's the gross primary production, we're talking about what's in this whole ecosystem, what is the most or what is the total amount of light energy that's converted into chemicals. Net primary production means take everything that's created and subtract the energy that's used. So you should know or may have learned about gross and um, net, like say for example gross profit and net profit. Gross is everything, net is everything, subtracting what you use to get it. Okay. So gross primary production minus the energy used for respiration is called net primary production. In terms of different ecosystems, some are very good at primary production and some are terrible. 
So if you look at these, um, the blue and the green bars, um, again, this, um, this diagram is in your book. It basically shows how much of um, how pr how productive different ecosystems are. This first graph shows you what percentage of the Earth's surface area is represented by the ecosystem. So you can see 65% of the Earth's ecosystem is open ocean. Um, in terms of just uh, the green bars, which is Earth or terrestrial, 4.7% um, of the Earth is extreme desert, rock, sand, or ice, or places that are in uninhabitable. When you, but instead, if we want to look at the average net primary production, like what who is the most productive, what gets the most light and converts into energy, you could see that algal beds and coral reefs are the most productive in the water, and tropical rainforests are the most in um, on Earth or terrestrial. Um, in terms of percentage of the net's primary production, the open ocean, even though it's very, very, very tiny, like the open ocean barely makes any energy, because there's so much open ocean, it actually contributes to 25% of the Earth's production. Um, tropical rainforests, again, even though there's barely any, there's only 3.3% of the, of the Earth is tropical rainforest, it contributes 22% of the net primary production. So that's why you see a lot of environmentalists want to protect the rainforest. Now, you're probably wondering how come some are very productive and some aren't? Well, first of all, since primary production is based on light energy, it all depends on how much light is available. Um, the higher the depth, like for example in the water, like the lower you are in the water, there's less photosynthesis. So you're looking for places that are warm or have lots of sun. So that's why places that are near the equator, like the coral reefs and the tropical rainforests, they have the highest primary production. Also what's affected by is how many nutrients are available. So in marine environments, for example, if there's a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus, then there'll be a lot of production as well. Think of a plant. A plant needs soil, sun, um, and nutrients. So it has to have the nutrients and it has to have sunlight. Other key factors are temperature and moisture. So the higher the temperature um, and, the, and lots of moisture, like think of a rainforest, um, then I'll get more primary production. Now, this is just a, a vocab word that you should have learned from the last chapter, but a nutrient-rich lake that supports uh, algal growth, it's called eutrophic. So um, I mentioned this in the last PowerPoint, but again, every time you go up a trophic level, or every time a feeding level, you go up a feeding level, or every time somebody, an organism eats something else, the energy transfer, the energy transfer is only 10% efficient. So only a fraction of the energy is stored in food, and the rest of the energy is lost as heat. Remember that energy flows, energy does not cycle um, within an ecosystem. So say for example, um, the plant has 200 joules of energy, when a caterpillar eats it, it only gets about 20 of it because only 10% um, is transferred. So here's another example. Uh, pretend there's 1 million joules of sunlight. Well, that means the plants only get 10% of that, which is 10,000, which means something that eats the plants only gets 10%, only gets 1,000, which means secondary consumers, 10% of that is 100, and tertiary consumers only get 10 joules. So that's why um, people suggest like having a vegetarian diet or to feel more energetic, eat more um, primary producers because there's more energy there. The more or later on in the food chain that we eat, that means less energy we get. Um, so that type of thing um, can also be illustrated in something called ecological pyramids. Your ecological pyramids, they sort of give some insight into food chains. So the loss of energy really limits the number of top level carnivores. So say for example, um, this is a, a Michigan bluegrass field and this is measured in number of individual organisms. So say for example, there's about 6 million producers. That means they can only support about 700,000 primary consumers or 354,000 secondary consumers or only three tertiary consumers. So remember since we go 10% each way, there's only so many tertiary consumers, secondary consumers that an ecosystem can hold. So that's why food webs only have four or five trophic levels. And this is the same thing except for it's by biomass. Biomass is kind of like in weight, how much uh, energy um, is available. So if there's 800 producers, that means there's only 37, uh, 37 grams or biomass available for consumers or 11 for secondary or 1.5 in tertiary. So that's why um, these pyramids are there, they're illustrators, and they show you how much a food chain uh, can be supported. Um, so the same thing with humans. We just I just talked about this earlier. So a human can get more energy if they eat more vegan or vegetarian foods. But if they eat cows or pigs or whatever, there's very less energy or humans need to eat more to capture energy. 
Um, so that was about energy flow. This one, this next section is about how matter cycles. Um, we're going to talk very briefly about each of these cycles and we'll go more in depth later on. Uh, matter um, is cycled. That matter, they usually call it biogeochemical. So bio meaning life, geo meaning rock, chemical meaning, you know, the chemicals. Nutrient cycles contain both biotic, living, and abiotic, non-living components. Those that are, um, those are, it switches off between organic and inorganic parts of the ecosystem, and there are four cycles you need to know. There's the water cycle, or hydrologic cycle, which most of you know, carbon cycle, which you might know from if you've studied uh, global warming, and then two that may be new to you or should be reviewed from bio, which is nitrogen and phosphorus. So first of all, um, let's go through these cycles. So here's an example of a cycle. Just know that um, for example, uh, organic materials are available as nutrients, which then fossilize, which is then burned into the air, um, which is then used in the water, and then the mineral. So that basically, this is just a general diagram of letting you know that things cycle. So let's go over these cycles. First cycle, the water cycle. You should have studied it back in elementary school. Um, you could start anywhere because it's a cycle. Um, water evaporates, becomes clouds, rains on the land, runs off into the water, and starts the process over. This is a great example of um, chemicals cycling. Okay, one that's kind of new is carbon dioxide, carbon di or the carbon cycle. As you know, carbon dioxide is something that we breathe out, but plants breathe in. So that's the basic cycle: cellular respiration. We breathe in, or sorry, we breathe out carbon dioxide, and then plants breathe in photosynthesis. The problem is, is that um, when we die, okay, or when fish die. We decompose into the ground, and you may not, you may or may not know this, but um, after long periods of time, millions of years, our fossils, both dinosaurs, humans, animals, we actually become oil. Okay, so the gas that you burn is actually from dinosaurs. Um, you may or may not know this, but factories, or when we need gas, we burn fossil fuels, which comes from you know the the fossils of us and other animals. When it burns into the air, we actually add more carbon dioxide. So the problem is, is that um, normally it's just photosynthesis and respiration. So this, this is the normal carbon cycle. We breathe it out, plants breathe it in. We breathe it out, we breathe it in. But the cycle is messed up. You see this giant arrow because as we die, um, we become fossil fuels and we burn way more of it than we're going into the ground. Next one is the nitrogen cycle. This is one that's very difficult for people to understand because there's way more steps than the water cycle and the carbon cycle. First of all, there's nitrogen in the atmosphere. You may or may not know this, but the most common gas that you breathe in or that's in our atmosphere is nitrogen. Some people think it's oxygen, but really it's nitrogen. Nitrogen cannot be used by plants as it is. So you need what they call nitrogen fixation in which bacteria on plants take nitrogen in the air and they fix it, meaning they make it into plants can use it. Then we have something called nitrification where that, those, um, that nitrogen that's fixed turns into ammonium which turns into nitrite, which turns into nitrate, and now plants can use it. So again, nitrogen fixation, they did it from the air, and I turn it into ammonium, which turns into nitrite, which turns into nitrate, and I could use that. And then there's denitrification, the third piece of the nitrogen cycle, in which um, this nitrogen is then eventually released into the atmosphere, and I start the cycle all over again. This denitrification can be done by bacteria or different things, but that's the real process of the nitrogen cycle. Okay. And the last one is the phosphorus cycle. Think of rock. It's a very, it's a very simple cycle because nothing really happens. But um, again, you could start anywhere. Think of like a plant that has phosphorus, um, and it takes in phosphorus, and there's the cycle. Okay, so it takes in phosphorus, it dies, becomes phosphorus, and starts that process all over again. But sometimes some of that is not absorbed by plants, and it leaches into the water. The water then, because of um, plankton and, and uptake and the cycling of the ocean that phosphorus can come back up um, and it's called geologic uplift and becomes rock and then that rock is blown off as dust or rocks and eventually can run off into the ground again and become used by plants. So that's the phosphorus cycle. So the last two slides, um, how do you restore an ecosystem? There's two ways. One's called bioremediation and one's bioaugmentation. So how do you fix an ecosystem? There's two ways. The first one, bioremediation, is using organisms to detoxify polluted ecosystems. So bio meaning life, and remediation is to fix. So um, for example, um, I don't have a picture on here, I think maybe it's in the next slide. Um, pretend there's like an oil spill. 
they use like bacteria or, or different types of single celled organisms. They throw it into the, where there's an oil spill and they eat the oil organically. You want bioremediation because that's what happens naturally. Bioaugmentation means introducing desirable species such as nitrogen fixers to add essential nutrients. So bioaugmentation, bio meaning life again, and augmentation means to make bigger or to make better. Um, this means that you want to introduce species again um, from the last uh, lecture. The problem with introducing species is that it could have unintended consequences. So by augmentation, um, you want to add more nitrogen fixation or you want to add more plants or add more animals that would make the uh, ecosystem better. So here's, um, here's an example I was talking about. So um, you may or may not know what groundwater is. Most of the water, if not all of the water we drink, comes from the ground or groundwater. Um, but one time, um, in different times, it was contaminated with uranium. So what they did, again, is they took these um, bacteria, they took these different organisms um, and fed it to the groundwater and then ate all the uranium and made it clean again. So these are ways in which ecosystems can be restored. So hopefully you understand this. Again, it's a big topical overview. Try to go a little bit more in detail. Um, you want to read through the chapter to get through everything. And if there's anything you don't understand, again, feel free to ask myself or ask Mr. Xu in class. And, then, and again, also you're going to write down an interesting question after this lecture. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you all when I see you all.